Funding for this program was provided in part by the Division of Continuing Education at Brigham Young University. Welcome our uh, viewers to uh, the 34th and concluding uh, session of these roundtable discussions uh, where we've been talking about uh, the New Testament. We'll conclude today with the final chapters in the uh, book of Revelation. But let's first introduce our uh, uh, participants. We have first here Brother Victor Ludlow. And next to him, Brother Jeffrey Marsh, and then Brother Richard Draper, and myself, Brother Joseph McConkie. Let's pick up in the uh, 19th chapter of uh, Revelation, and uh, Brother Marsh, we'll let you get us started there. You know, after our last session talking about destruction and challenges, it's refreshing to read this part of the vision now. In verse 1, And after these things, I heard a great voice of much people in heaven saying, Alleluia, salvation and glory and honor and power unto the Lord our God. You know, uh, it's interesting that there will be a grand and glorious second coming. The whole world will witness. But previous to that, there are other comings and appearances of the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, Acts chapter 3, Peter prophesied of the first vision where the Father and the Son would appear to begin the restoration of all things, fulfilled by the prophet Joseph Smith's first vision. Malachi prophesied the Savior would appear in his temples in the latter days, fulfilled and ongoing in these, in these days. Uh, there's a prophecy in 3 Nephi 21 that the Savior would appear in New Jerusalem when it's built. Uh, Doctrine and Covenant section 27, there would be an appearance of the Savior in a valley of Adam on Diamond. And section 116 of the Doctrine and Covenants identifies the valley, the very place where that would occur. All those appearances so let me, precede... Let me uh, read just a couple of verses from section 133, which is one of the great revelations on the second coming. When the Lamb shall stand upon, upon Mount Zion, and with him 144,000, having his Father's name written on their heads, uh, wherefore, prepare ye uh, for the coming of the bridegroom. Go ye out to meet him. For behold, he shall stand upon the Mount of Olive and upon the mighty ocean, even the great deep, and upon the islands in the plural of the sea, and upon the land of Zion. So what we have is a concept of uh, comings and comings and comings that precede the coming. So, uh, again, there's a lot happening. And that's, that's important because some people assume the Battle of Armageddon and the Savior's appearance there is the second coming. No, that's a previous appearance to that area of the world preceding this great and glorious uh, coming we're going to read about today. Kind of like it's the opposite of after his marvelous resurrection on that Easter Sunday, he was around for a few weeks here in the Americas uh, among the ten tribes. There were a number of times when he was there before he left. And likewise, there's going to be a number of times when he's here and around and about before he actually returns in his when, when the scriptures say he suddenly appears in his temple, I don't think any of us would want to limit that to one appearance and one temple. I don't think we want to tell no. him how many times he can come. Uh, that's, uh, that's going to be multiple and uh, spiritually very exciting. Well, we, we may want to note that uh, as we were talking last class period, these destructions have to come. And this, the second coming, I might add, puts an end to the destruction. Uh, John testifies that Jesus comes to destroy the destroyers of the earth. Other, otherwise, they would carry the earth down with them. So the second coming is to put an end to it. But of course, the reason for the second coming, or the reason for the destructions, I should say, is because of the work of Babylon. And Babylon uh, had been an ancient power. It was interesting 
as you read in Isaiah, and these two chapters, 13 and 14 of Isaiah, are also in the Book of Mormon section there in 2 Nephi. A lot of Latter-day Saints don't get to them because they don't get that far in 2 <laughs> Nephi. But uh, chapters uh, 23 and 24 in 2 Nephi, which are 13 and 14 in Isaiah, Isaiah foretells the downfall of Babylon. Considering that Babylon, even though Assyria governed the region out of Nineveh, Babylon was the cultural, political, well not political, co uh, commercial, religious center of the Assyrian Empire. It's like saying in the United States our political seat of power may be in Washington, D.C., but the banking, commercial center might be in New York, the entertainment industry might be in Hollywood, there might be other centers of, of influence throughout the country. Well, for the Assyrian period it was just Babylon. And Babylon's greatest days were yet to come as she would overthrow the Assyrian yoke, establish a new empire, the Hanging Gardens. People must have thought Isaiah was crazy. This ancient city, so powerful, how could he ever prophesy her downfall? It will never happen. But it started with the Persians and then carried on with the Greeks. And the, by the time of the Roman Empire that John's talking about Babylon, it's just a collection of mathematicians and astrologers that are there. The real ancient Babylon has almost fallen into oblivion and he sees the same thing to happen with the spiritual Babylon. There are times, particularly now, where it appears to be so dominant, so powerful, you would be crazy to think life would ever change and that it wouldn't have its influence anymore. But that downfall is just as inevitable. And what's interesting is how it happens. Yes, and let me just, uh, I just want to piggyback on, on where you're going and then, and then uh, bring, up to this last, uh, bring us up to this last statement, and that is, it is interesting that Babylon represents the, the um, philosophy, the theology and the philosophy of the degenerate in the last days, which are essentially antichrist, and that is to say they're promising salvation through means other than those the Lord made, laid down. Or promising there's no need for a salvation. Uh, uh, yeah, well, immediate happiness and immediate gratification. And so she sells her goods. All the nations partake of those goods. That is to say, they drink of the wine of Babylon. They really believe that materialism is the answer. It doesn't bring them happiness. And then when Babylon herself falls, that is to say, the economic structure of the world then collapses down. Uh, what happens to Babylon? She is killed by her lovers. Notice uh, chapter 17, verse 16. And the ten horns which thou sawest, again, Jeff, uh, degenerate nations, okay, degenerate people's institutions, and the ten horns which thou sawest upon the beast, these shall hate the whore, and shall make her desolate and naked, and shall eat her flesh, and burn her with fire. And yet, ironically, in the very next chapter, chapter 18, verse 15, the merchants of Babylon, which were made rich by her, shall stand afar off for fear of her torment, weeping and wailing. They're the ones who see it coming down and, and greed and avarice. It, it's like the end of the Book of Mormon and the Jaredites and the Nephite nations. They're, the day of grace is past with them, that they've lost all hope for redemption. It implodes, it self-destructs. You know, uh, Hugh Nibley once made an interesting analogy. He said, the whole time a play is out on stage, there's a new set being constructed behind the scenes. The economy of the theater requires that the night a play closes the new set's got to be ready to go up. Babylon is on stage right now with all her, verse 22, musicians and pipers and harpers and trumpeters and craftsmen. And yet Babylon is beginning to come undone at the seams. And we don't need to take it apart. Babylon's doing a real fine job of yes, self-destructing. Yes. What we need to do is be behind the scenes erecting Zion and you know, making the, sure the, the that it's The perfect illustration here is in section 133, where you read the uh, direction, uh, go out of Babylon, and then the very next phrase is, be ye clean mm. that bear the vessels of the Lord. Uh, you've, got to, uh, you've got to be clean. Uh, when you're, uh, when you're uh, clean, then uh, you can enjoy the outpouring of the Spirit, and the Lord can put His power and authority on you. Then and you should be involved you in, His name. In, in doing something with and, it. And, 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 that's what, and that, that's what has to stand behind all of this. And, that's the imagery of this, that kind of one of the threads that ties this whole book together. And it brings us right into chapter 19, which is the second coming. And it's interesting yeah. 
that it, it, as we move from chapter uh, 9 to chapter 10, we anticipate the second coming. It doesn't happen. Mm -hmm. We get to John's call in chapter 11, and then we get the three woes, and we turn to chapter 12, expecting it to be the second coming, and he doesn't come. Now, at last, in chapter 19, we actually have the coming of the Lord to bless the people. And it is interesting, uh, Jeff, as you note, the righteous are singing, Alleluia, uh, at last. He's coming at last, mm -hmm. and so on. You love that phrase in verse 7, the wife hath made herself ready. This great marriage. How long does it take a woman to get ready for a marriage? <laughs> I, I mean, thought you were going to say, how long does it take her to get ready? <laughs> <laughs> you know, the beautiful adornments, preparing yourself covered head to foot in pure white. Zion that we're trying to build is more than just a place. We could put up a building anywhere and call it Zion, but that would not be a fit abode for God. Zion is a culture. We're trying to prepare movies. We're trying to write books. We're trying to prepare a Zion culture that will be ready to receive her king when he returns. And it's like the adorning of a woman for the day of her marriage. Well, uh, it's interesting, too, that uh, the, you know, she is getting ready. She is being clothed. The Greek word to be clothed upon is enduo, from which we get the word endowed. endowment. So, so here is the woman there being endowed mm -hmm. so that she is now ready for her king to Which come is back. what Joseph mentioned earlier, that we, we get in the mainstream of the church, you receive by covenant your ordinances, and you continue in that path serving in the kingdom of God. The best way to build Zion is to be a garden, average, variety member of the church. Faithful plotter. Yep. And then we, we are invited to the feast. I mean, it's not just for the bride and the groom, but we're part of the wedding party here. Verse 9, uh, one of the Beatitudes that, that John inter that we have here in the book. Blessed are they which are called unto the married supper of the Lamb. And he saith unto me, these are the true sayings of God. I mean, this, this imagery of the wise and foolish virgins, the feast, the marriage, the ceremony, the celebration is, is ready to come. And then verse 11, I saw the heaven open, beheld a white horse. He that sat upon it was called faithful and true, and in righteousness he does judge and make war. His eyes were as a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns, and he had a name written that no man knew but himself, and he was clothed with vesture dipped in blood. Uh, Isaiah talks about that, I think, in, in chapter 63, as he talks about him like one who's trodden the wine press. Well, section 133, when the Savior appears, he'll be dressed in bright, reminding red robes. Yeah. You know, this is interesting imagery. He talks about a wedding and fine, clean linen, and in the very next verse, it's a warrior who shows up in yeah. red, red, bright clothing. It's the Christ returning to the earth to make the final end of all wickedness and to join with the saints and enjoy a honeymoon of a thousand years of peace on the earth. Which then brings us, of course, uh, over to John's testimony. Oh, I'm sorry, I was going to mention, so there's two suppers we're invited to. Yeah, one, yeah, we're, or two suppers we have a choice. Right, either the marriage feast or, <laughs> verse 17, the supper of the great God, the destruction that will accompany yeah, that, that That's where I was going with verse 16. Uh, the one who comes is King of kings and Lord of lords. And I saw an angel standing in the sun. He cried with a loud voice saying to the fowls of the air. So that, that's the other feast coming right there. Huh? Come, verse 18, that ye may eat the flesh of kings and the flesh of captains and the flesh of mighty men. So these great people of Babylon now are going to come down as the, uh, as the age closes. So you're either part of the marriage or you become a briquette in the great last barbecue. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, very, very well said. And then that, of course, brings us to chapter 20, where uh, we have at last the millennium actually beginning. And the first act of that, of course, is the, dis the uh, casting out of Satan, verse, three, or verse 2, uh, uh, where the, uh, the serpent, the devil, Satan, is bound a thousand years. And they cast him into bottomless pit, shut him up, and, seal, uh, and set a seal upon him. It's interesting that he is cast out, he is shut up, and then he is sealed. I mean, that gate is put away. You know, the Book of Mormon says there are three things that happen to bind Satan. First Nephi 15, that he is literally bound. He has no more power. Second, the wicked are destroyed. And third, the righteousness of the saints is increased. Yeah, but this, they but, won't listen but to But this is anymore. a priesthood power play. Yes. This isn't just that we got righteous and so right. we couldn't function. Exactly. This is a priesthood power play where by the authority of the priesthood he's bound. And yeah, seen. some have thought 
it's just an increase in righteousness that binds him. But yeah. boy, the scriptures testify this is a literal binding, yeah. and he's gone. Satan is bound by priesthood authority, and then he is bound by the righteousness of the people, and it's cooperation. All right, the the righteousness of the people then allow the uh, Satan to be bound for a while. But then we get to verse 7, and when the thousand years has expired, Satan shall be loosed out of his prison, which is really frightening. What, what is it that can loose Satan out of his prison? It would have to be a generation that would allow him back into their lives. Wickedness, where the power of God, the power of the priesthood is no longer there as this barrier. You know, the last few verses of Jacob 5 says that at the end, after a, thou a long time of peace on the earth, there will come, it says, bad, evil fruit back into the earth. This is the allegory of, of the of, olive tree. Right. Yeah. That well, wickedness but, comes again on the earth. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we, and we've got uh, the scenario in 4th Nephi. What happens in 4th Nephi? A generation, two generations, three generations of, of righteousness, and then what? They did not dwindle in unbelief. That, that is so shocking. They knew the gospel was true. They didn't care. And then, of course, we know the Gadianton robbers sought out the old secrets. And I'm wondering if that's not going to happen at the end of the millennium, mm -hmm. where we have people actually seeking out the old secrets due to pride and materialism that's crept, crept back, into, uh, back into the culture. But they don't win, right? No, they don't win because of verse 8. Okay. <laughs> Uh, and shall go out, he, he, Satan, shall go out to deceive the nations which are in the four quarters of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them together to battle, the number of whom is as the sand of the sea. They went up in the breadth of the earth, which really makes you feel that uh, there's going to be a lot of apostates during this time, a lot of them, and compass the uh, camp of the saints about, which suggests that the saints aren't going to be that many. And I suspect Satan uh, and the host really have a moment of glory right here like uh, they did over the death of the two prophets in, uh, at Armageddon, right? They really think that they've had it. And then fire came down from God of heaven and devoured them. So this is the last gasp of a dying regime, yeah, and it's, it's over. <laughs> and it's, it's all over. Boy, but it's, he takes us from what's happening here on the earth and puts it now in the context of an eternal plan of salvation. Now that this is all over here, I mean, in the meantime, what's happened to everybody that's lived here? Well, the end of this chapter, is, as we read in the footnotes and in the last few verses, the dead stand before God and are judged. So whether we were here long ago now in anticipation of during the millennium at the end of, all of us are going to stand before God and be judged. And that's, he's given us the whole picture. Now it's up. He makes it individualized. What are we doing in our particular time? How are we going to be judged? Heading for the next chapter, those who overcome shall be sons of God, and the earth attains its celestial glory. Now there's the ultimate destiny. But who that, that overcomes, verse 7, he that overcometh shall inherit all things, and I will be his God, and he shall be my son. We might want to cross-reference this to 1 John 5, verse 5 where John gives us a definition of what it means to overcome because we saw this earlier with the epistles to the seven churches. They were conditional upon those who overcome. Here, those who overcome, they will be my children. John says, but who is he that overcometh the world? But he that believeth in Jesus, that Jesus is the Son of God. So that's the critical element of overcoming. He that believeth that Jesus is the Son of God. That's why faith in the Lord Jesus Christ is the first principle of the gospel. Um, I like chapter 21. What's the reward? Verse 1, a new heaven, a new earth. This earth will be celestialized at the end of that judgment, taken back into the presence of God, a new heaven. Verse 3, the tabernacle of God is with men. We're in God's presence. And then verse 4, is it worth it? God will wipe away all tears from their eyes. Is it worth it to be faithful? There will be no more death, no more sorrow, no more crying. Brigham Young said one time, he said, when we get to the promised land, the celestial kingdom, we'll look back on all the losses, the crosses, and the sufferings that we had in this life, and we'll say, what of all that? We're here now. And I like verse 22 playing off of that same thing. Though the tabernacle is in heaven, John says, and I saw no temple there. It's interesting. He, he looks at the heaven and there's no sea. 
And that's the home of chaos. That's where the monster came from. Remember, out of the sea came the monster. So the monster's home, the, the, the uh, dragon's home has been destroyed. But also he sees no temple there suggesting that the genealogical work has been done. The people have now been saved and the work, God's work, has now been executed. And therefore, the uh, will that we met in Revelation chapter 7 has now been executed. God is now triumphant. And the people reign forever and ever for evermore. And the story says. then has come full circle because it's one that began, in, as we uh, talked about in the, the 12th chapter, the war in heaven, and that there they overcome, overcame by the testimony by the power of their testimony and through the blood of the Lamb. And so that's where the battle starts. That's where the final testimony seals up. And, and then and in that verse, this is my work and my glory. The whole work and glory of God yeah. is to have brought us through this whole process back into His presence now to be like Him. Not just with Him, but to be like Him. Can you think of any other theology in the world that allows mortals to become like God? Like Him. Yep. One of the things that deserves just a little commentary because uh, every Mormon missionary knows he's going to run up against it, mm. Richard, and we'll mm. let you comment on this. In the 22nd chapter, uh, For I testify unto every man that heareth the words of the prophecy of this book, if any man shall add unto these things, God shall add unto him the plagues that are written in this book. And, and everybody uh, says, you know, that's the seal that proves that the, the Bible is Yeah, is that seals the Bible, more. yeah. Yeah, well, there's, there's a couple of responses to that one. One of them is anybody who can make that claim doesn't know the history of the Bible and therefore do, do not know that Revelation got in the canon very, very late and it may never have gotten into the canon if it wasn't for the fact that it was such a powerful revelation and, and so and strong. And of the books John wrote, this is the first. Revelation, it's, Gospels, the gospel, came later. gospel, and then the epistles even later. Right. Yeah. And then, of course, we've got Deuteronomy 4 and others that say, you know, you Similar don't thing. mess with the, the writings the of the book. And it's just, got it written, leave yeah, it that's alone. A, leave it alone. Yeah. This, the book, meaning the, the individual the book, not the Bible as a Kind whole. of a copyright. Yeah, it's a copyright <laughs> on the book, not on yes. the Bible, but yeah. on the book itself. You don't mess with it. Well, Bible well, Joseph, itself means library, so it's a collection of books. So this is his final warning or testimony with this book in the library. This the is Bible. why it's important, as you noted in an earlier discussion, that we think of this in terms of a scroll instead of the uh, bound yeah, well, codex that, uh, mm. that we know today. Mm. Well, Joseph, I could just pull out one more All scripture right. before we go. In chapter 19, verse 10, the appearance of the angel uh, to John, who assures him, I am a fellow servant and of thy brethren and, and that have, have the love testimony them. of Jesus. Just, mm -hmm. We're in this together. That's right. An I'm, angel. I'm your, your, I'm your friend. That's, I'm your fellow servant. Exactly You'll love right. that language. Mm -hmm. And then I, I love his command to John, worship God, for the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. And I think that's kind of what it's all about. You know, the, I, I love the book of Revelation, too, for the way it ends. In Genesis, man's walk and talk with God was interrupted, you know, by the fall. But in Revelation 22, 3, there shall be no more curse. Verse 4, they shall see his face. When it's all wrapped up, we resume our walk and our talk and our privileges with God, our eternal Father. Yep. Let me make an observation by just, in a sense, to bind together the, our discussion of the book of Revelation. And, and what we would say of the book of Revelation in like manner would be equally true of our discussion of, of the uh, New Testament or the Bible itself. One of my uh, uh, favorite passages of Scripture is uh, found in the Joseph Smith history. It's verse 74. It's after Joseph and Oliver have been baptized. And the prophet records as follows. He said, Our minds, being now enlightened, began to have the scriptures laid open to our understandings. And the true meaning and intention of their more mysterious passages revealed unto us in a manner which we never could attain to previously, nor ever before had thought of. And so uh, what we're talking about here is this. Uh, not only do we have a testimony that the Bible is the Word of God, not only do we teach and love and study the New Testament, but we have uh, a, a privilege to see with eyes that others can't see. Uh, if, if we can experience what Joseph is saying that we should experience, 
Uh, we're reading an entirely different book than anybody else in the world is reading. Uh, because of the spirit of revelation, our minds being now enlightened, uh, we had laid open to our understanding true meaning of the more mysterious passages, things that we never before could attain to or even had thought of. There's so uh, many levels and dimensions of what we can see and understand in the book of Revelation, for example, if we have the spirit of revelation. Mm -hmm. and, and, and that's what we get when we, uh, we get a spirit of uh, those great events of the sixth seal, the restoration of the gospel. It's the restoration of, of revelation. It's the restoration of prophets. It's the restoration of priesthood. It's the restoration of other scriptural texts. And spiritual and, gifts to and, accompany and, and, and all the spiritual gifts that go with it. And it places us again in a position where we ought to be able to open up this book and again, uh, just see all manner of things that uh, uh, are very frankly the sealed book to people that don't, uh, uh, haven't walked that same path and don't have that same opportunity. It's a sacred privilege. We ought to take it seriously. We ought to love it. We ought to love what the prophet Joseph Smith has done for us and all that the Lord's given us. And the Bible is surely chief among them. For expanded information on the content of this episode of The Acts to Revelation, visit our website at byubroadcasting.org. Funding for this program was provided in part by the Division of Continuing Education at Brigham Young University.